I thank you very much, Dr. Al Shahi, for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, Dr. Al Shahi approached me some months ago, maybe almost a year ago, about this conference. So it's a, it's a pleasure to finally see it uh, and, and to be present here. I'm sorry I wasn't able to join you yesterday afternoon. I think this is a very important topic, but I'm also old enough to realize how revolutionary and interesting it is that this topic is receiving more attention. I was a PhD student in the late 90s, and I uh, went along to a Brismas conference to give a paper on my PhD topic, which was about uh, the United Nations and the situation of the Baha'is in Iran. So it was going through all the documentation regarding the human rights situation of the Baha'is in Iran and giving an analysis and asking the question of how effective has UN pressure been in alleviating the persecution. Of course, unfortunately, it's got even worse since then. I was hoping that I was studying something that was gradually becoming history in terms of its intensity, at least. But sadly, that wasn't the case. But it was from an international legal framework. And when I gave a, an aspect of this as a paper in a, in a Brismas, a British Middle Eastern Studies conference, um, I only had one question, and that was, well, I had one comment and one question. The comment was, you're exaggerating. There's no such, the number of Baha'is in Iran is a handful. And then the second comment was, uh, you know, where, where we have so much colonialism and intervention in our countries, how could you possibly use a colonial lens such as human rights to critique the Middle East. And I, I found it so disappointing. I haven't been back to Brisbane. <laughs> but actually, the discipline, the scholarship, the student body has changed enormously. And now there are more and more scholars, there are more and more publications and students looking at human rights um, in relation to the Middle East. Of course, there is the problem of domestic implementation of international human rights standards. One could also critique to some extent, the scope of the international standards and you know, what kind of nuance can be introduced to international human rights standards when it comes to implementation. You know, if we look at country X that finds a particular aspect of human rights, such as freedom of religion or belief, hugely problematic politically, domestically, historically, then can we phase the implementation? So uh, I, for one, do believe in the universality of human rights standards, but I think we do need to think carefully about successful implementation so that we're not just uh, using the same rhetoric of international human rights law with no consideration of the serious barriers to implementation in particular contexts. And uh, that was one of the reasons <clears throat> I'm now participating, I'm a researcher as part of a research team looking at the domestic effects of UN treaty ratification in the countries of the Gulf Cooperation Council. So looking at the six GCC countries, um, we, we notice that there has been a huge increase in the number of United Nations human rights treaties that are, are becoming ratified, you know, that the countries are committing to legally. And that increase can be seen particularly in the past 10 years. But the question is, what effect is that having? So we're engaging with both governmental and non-governmental actors and asking them whether they think uh, there are domestic effects and ben benefits that are flowing from it, and if so, what, what they are. And um, I was in Qatar just <clears throat> last week in relation to this project, and it was very interesting that the, the, there were two workshops, governmental and non-governmental. The governmental said what you would expect. They said we have Sharia reservations in relation to freedom of religion or belief, also in relation to women's rights and other issues, but let's single out this issue. And um, we, we were even, uh, one speaker even said that, of course we have a Sharia reservation re regarding freedom of religion or belief. If we didn't, because we are Saudi Arabia, the whole world would rise against, the whole Muslim world would object to us and would rise up against us. So there was not only the sort of political uh, sense of obligation that Sharia reservations to freedom of religion or belief should be um, enshrined, but also that this was an obligation on behalf of the Muslim world that there should be such Sharia reservations. So of course, change of religion or belief is a, is a sensitive issue. <coughs> at the governmental level. I'm sure there are many members of the public that would welcome it for a variety of reasons. 
Um, but on the other hand, in the non-government uh, workshop, there were several participants uh, that had become the recipients of accusations of being kafir or being mortad or, or, or being non-believers. And if, uh, this was for political reasons, pure and simple. They, they weren't actually converts. Um, and they had become sensitized to this label just being, uh, to becoming accused of that and the criminal penalties that would flow from that. So they were saying, well, anyway, why shouldn't we have freedom of religion or belief? We invite millions of people to come to our countries to uh, aid the development and to serve the countries. Why shouldn't they have freedom of worship? So actually, there's also a sensitization from below and a response from below that is broader than the converts <laughs> or uh, the, com the religious minority community. So I think we're in very interesting times, and there are very interesting dynamics at flow. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to revisit some of the international human rights standards regarding both minority rights and freedom of religion or belief. So as we all know, uh, and I heard your audience is very human rights, uh, very knowledgeable in human rights terms. So I'm sorry if it's too simple, do signal to me and we'll move more quickly through um, what I had prepared. Um, but, you know, the whole rationale of minority rights, it is, it is a, um, minority rights is contested. It is part and parcel of the international covenant and of civil and political rights. But across the spectrum of states, there are uh, states that object to minority rights to some extent. France says we have no minorities. Uh, West, uh, many states will recognize minority rights more in relation to linguistic minorities and in relation to ethnic or what we sometimes call national minorities. And then countries that do have a minority rights structure of governance, uh, of government, so they have, you know, a minority bureau or a religious affairs bureau or a minority minister or something, some of those countries that are receptive to the idea of minority rights have a very rigid uh, structure for responding to minority rights. Um, and I think all of those are problematic, and I'll explain why. When we, when we look at the minority rights standards, the whole rationale is that by treating everybody equally, you are being unfair to minorities. Okay? So equality is a good and important notion in international human rights law. But what minority rights is giving recognition to is that sometimes there is vulnerability and disadvantage that comes from being a minority. And in order to actually, in actual fact, uh, allow for a platform of an equal starting point, we need to give special attention to minorities. Now, the second problem is that there is no, uh, states have not agreed um, one definition of minority rights. There are no legal uh, instruments that define minority rights. So you might think that this is hugely problematic <clears throat> and we can't go anywhere. But there are many areas. Don't worry about it. We have many areas of law where the definition is not uh, agreed by states. But nevertheless, we move forward um, with trying to uh, implement it and realize it. Um, what we do have are uh, definitions that are often referred to. Okay, so one such definition of minority rights was given by an expert of the United Nations Subcommission in 1977. Capatorti defined minorities as a group numerically inferior to the rest of the population of a state in a non-dominant position whose members being nationals of the state possess ethnic, religious, or linguistic characteristics differing from the rest of the population and show, if only implicitly, a sense of solidarity directed towards preserving their culture, traditions, religion, or language. I will revisit it. Ahmad said definitely no slides. Otherwise, I might have been tempted to, <laughs> to put this on a slide. But so Capitorti is saying that um, Inferior doesn't mean they are inferior. It, it says numerically inferior. So a minority is numerically a minority. Okay, I think we can all accept that, and that seems self-evident. Um, and you know, where are we? Where are the boundaries? The boundary is the state. Okay, so you're a minority in the whole state. 
this is problematic, but I think this is the most agreed definition, okay? I mean, of course, you can be a minority in a village, in a town, in a city, but be a majority overall. But international human rights law has not fully agreed to that, and there's actually case law that says you must be a minority in that whole country, okay? Um, they're non-dominant, okay? So we don't have a minority in power in Bahrain and Syria. We don't, because the, the international human rights law definition, at least, says they mustn't be in power, okay? So yes, we have uh, um, members of a minority who are in the leadership, but that minority is no longer a minority because they hold power, okay, in Syria and Bahrain. So they are numerically minorities in the whole country within the boundaries of that state, and they don't hold power. Otherwise, they are not a minority in human rights terms. This is important because we're giving special attention in human rights to minorities. If they're already in power, and, and then you're giving them special attention and special rights, that really wouldn't make a lot of sense. So let's remember that. Um, and they possess characteristics that they wish to continue. Okay, so we are not an uh, anthropological project of going around saying, ah, that looks like a minority. We must force them to continue their language, or that's an interesting cultural tradition. It must be preserved. It's not, a, it's not that kind of project. We are observing that there are members that have these characteristics, and they themselves wish to continue it. Okay, so languages can die. La uh, religions can die, okay? Um, national groups might um, assimilate in wider society. It is their choice, is what human rights law is saying, okay? We might have other lenses with which we look at this. So theologically, we might worry, or in terms of if we're a professor of diverse languages, we might be very sad when a language dies, okay? But in human rights, we're, we're not going out to preserve. We are observing that there are members that wish to continue characteristics that are different to the majority population, and we are giving them special attention, okay? Um, and then what rights do these minorities have? Well, there are a number of different human rights instruments, but let's focus on the strongest in international human rights law, and that is Article 27 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, so, and you know, there are more than 180 states that have ratified this covenant and therefore are legally bound by it. Uh, they have voluntarily ratified, they might have been encouraged, there might have been bilateral pressure, there might have been uh, embarrassment and name and shame to get them to ratify it, but they've ratified it and ultimately it was their sovereign choice, okay? But now that they've ratified it, they are bound by it. So Article 27 says, in those states in which ethnic, religious, or linguistic minorities exist, persons belonging to such minorities shall not be denied the right in community with the other members of their group to enjoy their own culture, to profess and practice their own religion, or to use their own language. Now, especially in the Middle East context, we should observe that it could be all of those characteristics. There are religious minorities that have a distinct culture and a distinct language, okay? So it's not either or, it's the combination of those characteristics that they should be allowed to enjoy. So this is the, in a nutshell, what minority, uh, the definition of minority is and one of the most essential standards, uh, legally binding standards that apply to minorities, okay? Um, let's unpack minority rights a little bit, and I'm just going to uh, give you sort of three or four essential components of minority rights, because I think they're very pertinent also to the Middle East. So one is that um, the interesting thing about minority rights, uh, even more interesting than freedom of religion or belief, which is actually my key area of academic um, expertise, but an interesting thing that minority rights brings to religious minorities is a recognition of culture as well as religion, okay? Religious minorities, of course, by definition, share a religion or belief, okay? But additionally, minority rights gives 
because it's concerned with the broader spectrum of minorities, of course, it also brings to the table the question of culture. And this culture is to be uh, enjoyed in community with the other members of their group. We often find that the understanding and the emphasis in freedom of religion or belief is on individual rights. And uh, we'll look at that in a moment. I think maybe that needs to be so, OK? But sometimes that then diminishes the fact that one manifests and worships and teaches and practices more often than not in community with others, uh, in association with others. Uh, you know, there can be very individualistic practices of religion or belief. And people should, of course, be free to be very private and very individual and personal in matters of religion or belief. But more often than not, people also enjoy participating in that communal aspect. And minority rights emphasizes that in community with others. Secondly, I hope that's not coming from me. Uh, it's, it's not good to wear a scarf or a necklace when you're having one of these mics. Um, Secondly, um, what is shared, what minority rights recognizes, is that minority rights is to be enjoyed and uh, are owned by groups. They share a common culture, language, or religion. And there are no other conditions that are required it, um, for the enjoyment of minority rights. There's a general comment 23. There's an interpretation of the Article 27 that I just mentioned. Sorry, I'm uh, quoting you numbers. But you know, we, we said that uh, in those states in which minorities exist, they shall not be denied the right in community with others to um, enjoy their own culture, language, and religion. Okay, That provision was interpreted by a UN human rights body. And they insisted that minority rights is to be enjoyed by everybody. Uh, you don't have to be a permanent resident to enjoy rights. You don't need citizenship to enjoy minority rights. Okay, So this is, again, hugely crucial in many parts of the Middle East. There are countries that we all know of in the Middle East where 95% uh, of the workforce are, are migrant workers. In fact, even the word migrant workers is resisted. The, this, these countries insist that they are temporary workers, not migrant workers. But these temporary workers may have been in those states for three or four generations. Okay, So can the state deny them minority rights? No, insists the Human Rights Committee. They say that they're, you, know, you don't have to have, be a citizen in order to enjoy minority rights. You can be a tourist and enjoy minority rights. Okay, <laughs> You could have a transit and stopover and enjoy minority rights. So it is applicable to everybody. Let's do this. Um, thirdly, who decides whether there are religious minorities in a particular country? This is crucial, because if the state says, we don't have any, then they don't guarantee any minority rights. Is it so easy to um, escape the obligation? Well, no. The UN Human Rights Committee, again, the authorized body that uh, decides on Article 27, has said that the existence of an ethnic, religious, or linguistic minority in a given state party does not depend upon a decision by that state party, but requires to be established by objective criteria. Okay. So the state of X cannot say, I don't recognize, they're not a religious minority, or we only have one religious minority, or no, they are fellow Muslims, they are not a minority. They cannot so easily escape their obligations under Article 27 because the authorized UN human rights body has emphasized and interpreted that objective criteria should be used to determine the existence of minorities, of all minorities, and therefore including religious minorities. Again, very important. If we additionally take on, on board the Human Rights Committee's understanding reg regarding freedom of religion or belief, in that context, they have emphasized that religion or belief should be broadly constructed, construed, and not limited to, tradi to traditional religions. Again, a state might say that we only, recognized, we only recognize three religions, 
They are Islam, Judaism, and Zoroastrianism, or in the case of Egypt, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. And they're the only ones we recognize. Well, the Human Rights Committee says that you cannot just restrict it to traditional religions or beliefs. Okay? So objective criteria for determining existence is essential. Otherwise, we don't even have a starting point of wanting to claim minority rights. And then two, two essential and um, far-reaching elements of minority rights. One is that minorities may require um, special measures and positive measures for protection. Okay? Now, so we're telling a state that doesn't recognize um, the religious minority community, possibly, that says that they're not nationals, therefore they shouldn't be beneficiaries of minority rights, um, or wants to restrict it only to traditional religions. We're saying all of that is actually illegitimate and illegal under international human rights law. And in fact, you should be having positive measures and enabling measures with respect to these same religious minority communities. Okay? So the Human Rights Committee has said that positive measures by states may be necessary to protect the identity of a minority and the rights of its members. Why? This is actually very controversial in, in you know, sort of the political sphere and in the policymaking sphere. Why special positive measures for minorities? Even in the UK, we have a debate where Christians are saying, we too are a minority. Why are you, uh, I was just um, part of a research project looking at um, equality and non-discrimination on the basis of religion or belief in England and Wales. And first, I, I had to do a double take when I heard that uh, Christians are reporting that we are minorities and we are um, not favored as much as Muslims. Muslims and other religious minorities get preferential treatment that we, we should also enjoy. I mean, part of this is hype and at the neighborhood level, there have been policies that have fed into it. But first, I couldn't even understand why Christians would be claiming it. But then when you think about it further, it depends which church, which community, what policies have been um, introduced in that area, and, and their sense that they are a minority is an important policy and political consideration, regardless of whether they fit the definition <laughs> under um, international human rights law or domestic law. Um, so it's controversial to say that there should be positive measures for minorities, okay? But the, rush, the reason is um, that these positive measures may be necessary to protect the identity of a minority and the rights of its members to enjoy and develop their culture, language, and to practice their religion in community with others. So there is a condition on it, okay? So positive measures may be necessary if that is the only way that that religious minority community can continue to enjoy its rights, both as individuals and as a community, okay? And it could be that positive measures are not necessary because there is a context and a political sphere and a space in which those, um, the enjoyment is um, occurring, you know, that, that's enjoyment of the individual rights and community rights are being enjoyed without positive measures. But if not, or if there has been years of persecution or where, you know, there's a new historical moment that um, there's, after years of being crushed, the minority community is finally um, re-establishing itself, then it may be necessary to have positive measures. And finally, effective participation. Minority rights insists that minorities should effectively participate, not only in decisions that concern them, but also in wider society and in public life. Okay? So again, we're not trying to fossilize or crystallize communities in the way that we are labeling them, we are observing that there are individuals who wish to maintain a language, a culture, or a, a religion, and they have a sense of solidarity. At any time, any member can leave it, or not want to associate with it, or not want to be defined by it. But whilst there is that solidarity and uh, that community, then we should ensure that they not only uh, are involved in decision make decisions and questions that concern them, so presumably, I don't know, 
visas for clergy, travel, pilgrimage, matters of worship, teaching, teaching of their children, et cetera, et cetera. Not only those, but they should also be allowed to be effective participants in public life. Um, and even in economic progress and development, minority rights are far, quite far stretching in, in that way. So all in all, minorities uh, should be allowed to um, survive and be allowed to continually develop, okay? Freedom of religion or belief, I'll skip through very quickly because I want to get to three challenges that we face in relation to religious minorities in the Middle East. Okay? Uh, we know that um, the standards, the international human rights standards regarding freedom of religion or belief um, maintain many characteristics, but I just want to highlight um, one, two, three, four, about six essential criteria that we can distill from freedom of religion or belief standards. Firstly, freedom of religion or belief standards cannot be derogated in times of public emergency. Okay? Bahrain had announced three months of public emergency two years ago. Actually, they said after two and a half months, they've said that the public emergency has now ended. Egypt had a public emergency for how many decades? But um, so some, <laughs> sometimes public emergencies, um, again, that's illegal, but let's put that aside. But public emergencies can be very enduring sometimes. But even in times of public emergency, where some aspects of some rights can be suspended, freedom of religion or belief cannot be suspended. And this shows something of the importance uh, given these rights. Secondly, freedom of religion or belief has a very wide scope. It includes uh, religion and belief. Now, some religious people think, oh, this is really, this is crazy. You know, now we're protecting atheism and agnosticism and communism and this and that. And uh, many sort of practicing believers have a sort of discomfort with this. But let me tell you that there is an advantage also for religious communities, because in many countries, um, uh, they'll say, well, that's not a religion, that's not a religion, our holy book doesn't recognize that religion either. So actually the belief protection protects many religions in, in many parts of the world. So the scope is actually, I think, essential in, in the times we live in. Uh, theistic, non-theistic, and atheistic beliefs are to be included, okay? So it's not so easy to say, well, they're not a religion, therefore they're not beneficiaries of religion or belief. Actually, they are. Um, secondly, there should be no coercion in matters of religion or belief, and the right to uh, have a religion, to adopt a religion, and to change a religion or belief is absolute. It can never be limited under international human rights law. It is only the manifesting of religion in public that may sometimes be limited. And why can it be limited? Give me some reasons why manifesting religion, let's say, I don't know, uh, a, a prayer in a park or any other kind of manifestation. Why, what, what legitimate grounds can there be to restrict manifesting of religion or belief? Ideas? Public order. Public order. And Ravi will tell us the rest. <laughs> Morals? Sorry? Okay, so these are, uh, the, these are some grounds on which the public manifestation, but never the having, adopting, or changing of religion or belief. The public manifestation has, there are criteria on which the state can legitimately limit those rights. Um, and then what about the question of a state's religion or, a, or a, the, the ideological position of a state, okay? Um, the Human Rights Committee has not explicitly said that having a state religion is against the freedom of religion or belief of others, okay? They've played this one a bit carefully. It was 1976 that the covenant was agreed. Um, I don't know, we could, we could scan the world in 1976 or even today and see, well, how many states would you say are violating freedom of religion or belief if you automatically say that having a state religion or an ideology of the state uh, immediately per se, prohibits freedom of religion or belief to others. Instead, they have said that 
if there is a state religion, this shall not, let's read, should not, result in any impairment of the enjoyment of any rights under the covenant or in any discrimination. So uh, international human rights law does not currently ban having a state religion, but there is an extra due diligence or responsibility on that state to ensure that it does not deny rights to others or discrimination against others. And this is a big if, okay? Um, so when, let's look at all of this. Let's look at, we've looked at minority rights. Um, we've looked at freedom of religion or belief. These give quite a wide scope to the rights that should be enjoyed and states are committed to ensuring. What are the problems in the Middle East? Um, I think there are three main problems. One is that in many Middle Eastern states, there, there, have, there has been structures for recognition of religious minorities in the past, and we're talking about Dhimma status, the Ahl al-Kitab, and the Millet system. But we can critique, we can see in many ways that where traces of these systems endure, they are not sufficient in ensuring minority rights or freedom of religion or belief today. Why? Well, I think it relies on an understanding that there is a fixed community. It will not grow or shrink. There will be no conversion in or out. And that it's, very, it's too rigid to in any way be able to respond to the demands of minority rights or freedom of religion or belief. <clears throat> so there are limitations, OK? But we could also use these historical precedents as structures on which to build broader understandings, possibly. OK? Secondly, um, many of these states, and sometimes also communities, um, reject a broader understanding of religion or belief, okay? So if they have beneficiaries in mind regarding freedom of religion or belief or minori uh, minority, religious minority rights, then it's very limited, okay? And um, in fact, sectarianism has fueled that narrow, um, that narrow mindedness, okay? And thirdly, the very term minority is strongly resisted. Um, I, I was just in a, in a conference in Geneva with the independent experts on minority issues. She had been to the Middle East just two weeks ago, and she was shocked at how everybody rejected the term minority. So Agalia has a, um, well, it is partly political and it is partly uh, the term. So on the one hand, uh, Copts will say, we are Egyptian, we are not a minority, because otherwise there will be a suspect lens on them that they are rejecting or lack pride in being um, Egyptian, okay? But on, uh, and there's, therefore they're spies, therefore they're foreign, therefore they, uh, there's no reason to provide for them because they're rejecting Egyptianness, And the same across the Middle East, okay? But, but secondly, Aqaliya might have a sort of inferiority built into it, that you are not equal. So you, you, know, you reject being a minority because you neither think you're inferior, nor do you want to stop being an Egyptian, a Saudi, a Kuwaiti, or whatever. So we have these three major problems in relation to religious minority rights in the Middle East, but we also have a whole host of obligations that are nevertheless binding. And somehow we need to marry the two and advance along uh, maybe a gradual path towards enjoyment of all of these rights. Thank you. Thank you very much.